Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. This video is about Brownian motion or Wiener process with drift. We talk about the Brownian motion with drift as convergence of random walks. So we have a random walk. The steps are D1, D2, D3, and so on. They are independent and identically distributed. Each one of the Ds, DK, for every K that is a positive integer, is equal to plus delta with probability P or minus delta with probability Q. Delta is a positive real number, and P plus Q is equal to 1. So Q is just 1 minus P. In this random walk, the walker must take one step plus delta to the right or minus delta to the left. What are the statistics of DK? The first moment is plus delta times P plus minus delta times Q. And so the first moment of DK is delta P minus Q. This is zero only for the case of a simple random walk in which B is equal to Q is equal to one half. The second moment of DK is delta squared times B plus minus delta squared times Q. So that's delta squared P plus Q, which is delta squared. The variance of DK is the second moment minus the square of the first moment. So this is delta squared, one minus B minus Q squared. If we write this one as P plus Q squared, then this difference between two squares is 4PQ. And then we have the delta squared. So the variance of DK is 4PQ delta squared. The characteristic function of DK for any K that is a positive integer is the expectation of E to the I U D1. This is P, E to the I U delta plus Q, E to the minus I U delta. From this random walk, we construct a random process in which the index is a non-negative real number. So now using the steps, the IID steps, D1, D2, D3, and so on, we construct a random process X of T, where T is a non-negative real number. To construct X of T, we use a positive real number H, which plays the role of the time step. The process X of T is equal to zero, for t between 0 to h. If t is greater than or equal to h, x of t is the sum k from 1 to the floor of t over h dk. An example of x of t, if we have the steps d1, d2, d3 equal to plus delta, plus delta, and minus delta respectively, then x of t will be 0 all the way to h, the time step, for every t that is between h and 2h, this floor will be equal to 1 and x of t is equal to d1, which is plus delta. And so this will be x of t. Now, when t is between 2h and 3h, the number of terms in this summation is equal to 2. And x of t is the sum of d1 and d2. That's 2 delta. Then when t is between 3h and 4h, the number of terms in this sum is 3. And x of t is d1 plus d2 plus d3. And so that's delta and so on. So this is X of T. It is now a stochastic process with an index that is a non-negative real number. Our interest is to study the limit of this process X of T as H and delta tend to zero. So what will happen if the step in space and the step in time, both of them diminish towards zero? Before studying this, let's investigate this limit. What is the limit as h tends to zero from the right side of h times the floor of t over h? This limit is t because the floor of t over h is less than or equal to t over h, but is strictly greater than t over h minus one. Multiply all sides by h. So the right hand side becomes t and this tends to t as h tends to zero. The left hand side becomes t minus h. And this also tends to t as h tends to zero. By the sandwich theorem, the limit of h times the floor of t over h as h approaches zero from the right is equal to t. What are the statistics of x of t? So x of t is the summation of those dk's, the iid random variables. And so the first moment of x of t is the first moment of dk, p minus q delta, times the number of terms in the summation, the floor of t over h. If we multiply and divide by h, then we get this term, which we know tends to t as h tends to zero. And then we have p minus q delta over h. For the variance, 
Again, the guys are independent, so the variance of the sum is the sum of variances. So this is the variance of dk times the number of terms in the summation, which is the floor of t over h. Again, we can multiply and divide by h. We know that this tends to t as h tends to 0, and then we have 4 pq delta squared over h. We are interested in the asymptotics of x of t specifically. What will be the process x of t in the limit as delta, the step in space, and h, the step in time, both tend to 0? But note that we need to be careful when we take the limits, because in the expression of the first moment of x of t, we have the ratio delta over h, and in the expression for the variance, we have delta squared over h. So what we do is that we require that this quantity, p minus q times delta over h, is kept equal to a given constant data, which is a non-zero real number. Also, we require that 4pq delta squared over h is equal to alpha, which is a positive real number. So far, we have a random walk. We have the steps d1, d2, d3, and so forth. dk is plus delta with probability p minus delta with probability 1 minus p. dk has the characteristic function p e to the i u delta plus q e to the minus i u delta. Using those steps, those i i d random variables, we have the random process x of t with an index t, a non-negative real number. We obtain the first moment of x of t and the variance. Both of them they have this term, which tends to t as h tends to 0. And then in the expression for the first moment, we have this p minus q delta over h. We require that this is equal to a non-zero real number beta. And in the variance, we have 4 pq delta squared over h. Now this is alpha, a positive real number. In this expression here, write down q as 1 minus p. So 2p minus 1 is beta h divided by delta. Square both sides. So 4p squared minus 4p plus 1 is beta squared h squared over delta squared. Now in this expression for alpha, again, write q as 1 minus p. Then we have minus 4p squared plus 4b is alpha h over delta squared. Add these two equations. We get alpha h over delta squared plus beta squared h squared over delta squared is 1. Multiply both sides by delta squared and move it to the other side. We have a quadratic equation in h. Solving this equation, we can express h in terms of delta. Since h is positive, then we take the positive solution, the positive root. h is minus alpha plus the square root of alpha squared minus 4 times minus delta squared times beta squared. And then we divide by double this coefficient, 2 beta squared. We have h in terms of delta, and the expression has the two parameters, alpha and beta. Using this, we can write down p also in terms of delta. So 2b is 1 plus beta h over delta, divide both sides by 2, and then write down h using this expression. q is just 1 minus p. So now we have those relations, and we will investigate the convergence in distribution of x of t. Specifically, we study the limit of the logarithm of the characteristic function of x of t as delta tends to 0 from the right. We do so while obeying these relations. The characteristic function of x of t is basically the characteristic function of d1 raised to the power the floor of t over h. x of t is the sum here. And those guys are iid. And so the characteristic function of x of t is just the characteristic function of one of the d's, say d1. And then we raise it to the power equal to the number of terms in this summation, which is the floor of t over h. When we take the logarithm, this floor is here, and then we have the logarithm of p e to the i u delta plus q e to the minus i u delta. Multiply and divide by h, we have the old friend here, this quantity which tends to t as h tends to 0. The other term is epsi of u. And now the goal is to obtain the limit of epsi of u as delta tends to 0. Our interest now is to know to what limit this epsi of u will converge as delta tends to 0. The limit here is not arbitrary. h, p, and q are related to delta via these expressions. These expressions have the two parameters, beta, which is a non-zero real number, and alpha, which is a strictly positive real number. If we replace this h by its expression in terms of delta, we get 2 beta squared, and then we have the logarithm of p e to the iu delta plus q e to the minus iu delta. This is in the numerator. Note that if delta is set equal to 0, then in the 
numerator, we will have the logarithm of P plus Q, which is the logarithm of one, which is zero. In the denominator, if delta is zero, then this square root will be equal to alpha. Alpha minus alpha is zero. We are in a zero over zero situation. We can apply L'Hopital's rule. So the limit as delta tends to zero is the limit of the ratio of the derivatives, the derivative of the numerator divided by the derivative of the denominator. When we do the differentiation, we will get, for example, the reciprocal of this term here. And this is just one when delta tends to zero. When we differentiate the denominator, this is two square root alpha squared plus four beta squared delta squared. And then we have eight beta squared delta. So this derivative will come here as the square root of alpha squared plus four beta squared delta squared divided by four beta squared delta. Note that beta squared will go with this beta squared and two over four, that's one half. And then the square root when delta is zero is alpha. We need then to handle the limit as delta tends to zero of this bracket divided by this delta. We make use of Euler's identities. So e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta is two i sine theta. And e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta is equal to two cosine theta. Theta in our case here is u delta. So we will combine the exponentials depending on the sign, either as sine u delta or cosine u delta. Note that cosine u delta is unity when delta tends to zero, and so it is not problematic. So for example, when we combine this term with this term, we will get cosine u delta. It's not written here because you know the limit is just equal to one. But for the signs, I will keep them in the expression. Now let's see, we have minus u sine u delta over delta, and we want the limit as delta tends to zero. We can multiply and divide by u. Sine u delta over u delta as delta tends to zero is one. And so this will give us minus u squared. When we combine these two terms, as I said, we will get cosine u delta, which is one. And then we have to handle this quantity. We have delta squared in the denominator and we have square root alpha squared plus four beta squared delta squared minus alpha in the numerator. That's a zero over zero situation. We can apply L'Hopital. The derivative of the denominator is two delta. Of the numerator is this fraction here. Now, delta will go with delta. And as delta tends to zero, this square root becomes alpha. And so this quantity here becomes two beta squared over alpha. We have a two, we have beta, and then we have r u. And so this becomes r u beta over alpha. For this limit, this is exactly the same quantity. So it's two beta squared over alpha when we take the limit. And then sine u delta over delta, we can multiply by u, divide by u, and the sine u delta over u delta, that's one. And so we get i u over two beta and then two beta squared over alpha. Two will go with two beta with the square. So this is minus i u beta over alpha. Finally, we have this third, which comes from combining these two terms. We have one over the square root. This gives us one over alpha as delta tends to zero. And then sine u delta over delta, this will give us u. And so this is two i beta u, one over alpha. These two guys cancel, and then we have here i u two beta over alpha. We have an outside factor, one half of alpha. When we multiply, we have minus one half u squared alpha, and then we have i u beta. So the characteristic function itself tends to e to the i u beta t minus one half u squared alpha t, which is the characteristic function of a Gaussian random variable. Remember that if we have a Gaussian random variable with mean eta, and variance sigma squared, the characteristic function is exponential, i u eta minus one half u squared sigma squared. This is the characteristic function that we have obtained. Characteristic functions are unique, which means that if we see this characteristic function, it is the characteristic function of a Gaussian random variable. The mean or the first moment is beta t, and the variance is alpha t. So x of t is Gaussian, with a mean value of beta t and a variance of alpha t. We can study x of s minus x of t for s greater than t. If we start from the summation, this will be the summation. It's summation of the steps dk, which are plus delta with probability b and minus delta with probability one minus p. And the index k goes from one plus the floor of t over h to the floor of s over h. We can take the limit following almost the same steps as above. And we will find that this x of s minus x of t, this increment, the difference between 
the value of the process at time s and at time t also converges in distribution to a Gaussian random variable with mean beta times s minus t and variance alpha times s minus t. Note that this random variable and x of t, they depend on different steps. The summation representing x of t before we took the limit depends on the steps d1, d2, all the way to d of the floor of t over h, while the increment x of s minus x of t depends on those steps. There are no overlaps. Because the d's are ild, then these two sums for any value of h will be independent. So when we take the limit, obeying their constraints, we obtain a process at which at each time instant, we have a Gaussian random variable. Moreover, the increments of the process are also Gaussian. Let's denote the limiting process. So this is x of t after taking the limit as w of t. So it's a Wiener process with drift because the mean value is not equal to zero, or we can also say a Brownian motion with drift. W of t at any instant t is Gaussian. And W of t has independent increments. Now let's study the joint distribution of W of t1, W of t2, W of t3, all the way to W of tk, where k is some positive integer. Assuming that t1 is less than t2 is less than t3, less than tk. Note the following. We know that W of t1, W of t2 minus W of t1, W of t3 minus W of t2, and so on. Each one of those is Gaussian. Also, they are independent. So we have a vector here, a k-dimensional random vector, and the random variables in the vector are independent, and each one is Gaussian. So those random variables are jointly Gaussian, and the vector is a Gaussian vector. But we are not interested in these. We are interested in w of t1, w of t2, w of t3, and so forth. However, we can relate those random variables to those ones. W of t1 is equal to W of t1. W of t2 can be obtained by summing these two entries. If we sum them, W of t1 will cancel and we are left with W t2. So W t2 is 1 times W of t1 plus 1 times W of t2 minus W t1. If we want W of t3, we can sum those three terms and so on. So this vector, this k-dimensional vector of interest is this matrix times this vector. So this vector is an affine transformation of this Gaussian vector. And the rule is that an affine transformation of a Gaussian vector is a Gaussian vector. So this vector is Gaussian. Those random variables are jointly Gaussian. And this is true for any selection of T1 less than T2 less than T3 all the way to less than Tk. And this is true for every positive integer k. So the process W of T is a Gaussian process with independent increments.